So most of you know me, I'm Sean Peiser, uh, Deputy Director of Trusted CI, um, and um, uh, also a scientist here at the Berkeley Lab. Uh, we've got a fun hour for you, I hope, um, with a great set of panelists here who, um, uh, actually two of them traveled from Hawaii yesterday uh, just to be here, so I'm, I'm grateful to them for their time and, uh, and hope they're enjoying their day as well. Um, in 2022, Trusted CI, and a study on security of operational technology in cyber, research cyber infrastructure. And one of the key things that we learned in that process was that the installed life of some of this operational technology decades. Uh, and once it was there, you weren't gonna change it until maybe you knocked down the building and rebuilt it or until you had some sort of midlife refresh. And um, so, our takeaway was, well, what if you could do something about this when you're designing it? Uh, this is all what we all always talk about in security, but in this case, it's operational technology. It's a building, it's a ship, or something else like that. So in 2023, we've been working with uh, a number of different facilities that are, are involved in various stages of design and construction of research cyber infrastructure, or, or, or research infrastructure that contains a cyber infrastructure component. Um, in order to help them understand uh, how to build security in by design. Um, I will say it's a learning process. We have been learning with them as we go. Um, and uh, I will also say on a personal level, the past almost two years now about the, the uh, research operational technology and working with these folks have been a couple of the most fun years of my life. This is great stuff. I mean, you, you get to work with uh, some really, really interesting um, systems uh, when, you're, when you're working with these uh, kinds of things. So uh, the folks that we are going to talk to today are um, the trusted CI I've been working with include uh, folks from Oregon State University, which is taking delivery of the three NSF research class research vessels, uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography designing the California Coastal Research Vestal. Both uh, of these, um, uh, the, the RCRVs and CCRV are expected to be part of the US academic research fleet uh, eventually. Um, uh, trusted CI. Uh, has been supporting Oregon State with cybersecurity aspects of planning for the acceptance testing process of the RCRVs. Uh, we've been working with Scripps Institution of Oceanography on um, more on kind of the design and, and procurement aspects. Um, Trusted CI has also been working with the Ocean Observatories Initiative, which is replacing its underwater vehicle fleet, which includes gliders as well, uh, other autonomous vehicles, um, and has also been gaining some research insights uh, from the U.S. Antarctic program uh, about uh, its operational technology is given its construction of a billion dollar icebreaker that is being planned as well as refreshes of all three uh, Antarctic stations, McMurdo, Palmer, and Emmons and Scott South Pole Station. Uh, so the aim of this panel today is to support the broader community of uh, NSF program officers, major facilities, and, and other relevant scientific cyber infrastructure operators. Uh, we, we, we've sort of informally developed this, uh, this cohort of ships and poles um, because of the nature of things, and there are more ships and poles out there that we have not yet worked with yet. Uh, that being said, uh, you, you, some of you operate radio telescopes, some of you operate sensor networks, some of you operate buildings that have air conditioners of some kinds. These are all uh, cyber infrastructure that in some way touch science. Uh, I was talking with somebody earlier this year um, who mentioned to me um, that uh, the first thing you do on a campus is you make sure, sure the students are safe. Uh, the second thing you do is make sure the animal is safe, and the third thing you do is make sure the freezers are safe. So, because uh, these contain samples in them of various kinds, so it was uh, the, the, these are not unimportant or, or trivial things. So, uh, I'd like to introduce my panelists, and then we'll just dive right in. Uh, so, uh, uh, let's see. I'm, I, this is just in a different order, but that's all good. So, Craig Brizian uh, is the project manager for uh, NSF Ocean Observatory Initiative Data Center uh, that OSU has operated uh, uh, since um, July. One and is currently working with the OOI systems team and Dell to design a new data center to support OOI. I should just say as background, OOI is a fleet of instruments but collects and processes data on them as well. I'd um, like to introduce John Meyer, next over, Information Security Manager within Shipboard Technical Support, SIO, getting the oceanographic fleet and collecting and distributing data from the oceans. Uh, also responsible uh, in large part of security as well. Um, and uh, um, uh, it gets to do some really interesting, exciting things, as I've learned from John. Uh, uh, Chris Ramzos is a systems engineer for the Research Class Research Vessel Project from 
Oregon State University and contributing to the scientific design and specifications for the RCRV and is now working with the vessel's uh, transition team to uh, uh, prepare for deployment. And um, lastly, um, uh, Ezra von uh, Everbrook uh, is the Director of Information Systems and Services at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, strategic planning support, technical coordination for computing and networking, um, uh, both within and, and uh, around the institution. Um, and on Zoom with us today, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Tim Howard, uh, Information Technology Support Manager and IS uh, Information Security Manager for the US Antarctic Program. Uh, and um, he's, he came to NSF from NOAA, uh, where he also served as the Information Security Team Lead for NOAA's weather satellite. So this is a distinguished group of panelists, and I'm, I'm really happy have them all here. Um, so uh, let me start this out actually for the audience, uh, though. Uh, how many of you are in some way involved with operational technology of some kind within your facilities? And this again, OK, great, quite a few. This includes everything from card doors to, again, radio telescopes and turbines and winches. OK, so we've got a good crowd. Of you, those, how many of you might be involved some way in sure, this could be specifying requirements, uh, it could be um, securing them, networking them. Okay, all right, a few, very good. Uh, probably also some more here on the Zoom. Uh, let me start just with some, uh, some questions to the, the panel here to sort of get the, get the discussion going about things. Um, uh, maybe for um, uh, John, um, for the CCRV, can you speak to some of the design science goals of the CCRV? What's, what, what's intended for this, uh, to, to get out of this by, by the institution and the state, because the state's funding your ship? Yes, so the CCRV is a replacement for our current uh, coastal regional vessel, the RV Robert Gordon Sproul. Uh, anytime you say you need a new research ship, you don't just say, I'm going to replace it in time. You always want to add feature, add function. Um, in this case, we are hybrid research vessel. Uh, we're going to hydrogen and diesel fuel powered to satisfy some emissions regulations in California. Um, also help us secure state funding. Uh, it's a good story for the state of California. Uh, we are attempting to augment the scientific instrumentation suite that the ship has versus what we have on Sproul uh, by having more ocean mapping capability, more fish finding capability, uh, and then preserve all the other functions that we currently have on Sprout. Very good. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, for uh, Craig, um, can, can you talk a little bit on the RCRVs um, about the, both OT and IT cyber? And, I'm sorry. Yes, two Craigs. I apologize. Uh, Craig Rizian. Um, uh, oh, Craig, Chris Ramzos, I apologize. Um, the uh, cyber infrastructure for including, including both OT and IT on the RCRVs. Cool. Okay, so RCRVs, very similar background to what John um, just mentioned, right? We're trying to uh, think 40 years from and the, the, the ships we're replacing are 40, 40 years old. So we're bringing um, a wealth of new IT uh, and OT to operators um, and so what is that IT and OT? Uh, we're talking about uh, computing clusters on, on the ship, virtualization clusters, uh, maybe some edge processing clusters. Uh, but that's John provides for us, <laughs> too sure. Uh, but yeah, and on ship, right? Um, and, and on the OT side, there, there's um, quite, a, quite a lot of automation. Um, um, we're, we're shooting for having an automated, uh, not an uncrewed engine room. It's, 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 a, it's not like there's nobody in there, but uh, it's a regulatory bin you can fall in that allows you to have more automation. And so we have to prove that out over a year, um, prove it to the Coast Guard that you can do that. Uh, we're really sophisticated uh, launch and recovery, so kind of like robotic arms that make it a lot safer for people that are working on deck when they're at sea. Mm. Um, we're in like high degree of uh, covered with CCTV cameras, uh, integrated bridge systems, you know, for the for the vessel operators to, that help them, you know, navigate safely and be aware of you know, what's around them. Um, and it's, so it's, it's a it's a big step up, right? A big step function. Um, 
Yeah, if you want me to go into any more detail on that. Just... Well, well, I think we will over time, but I mean, what, what you're describing, uh, the, the, these, I'm, I'm thinking about my house, which is about 50 years old, and uh, the amount of automation that one would be putting in if we were to start from scratch in comparison to... Yeah. Your car, yeah. a car from 1983 is going to be fundamentally different from a 2023 car. You could actually fix the 1983 car. Uh, you know, uh, so. um, for Craig Rizian, um, can, can you also talk about the cyber infrastructure, including both IT and OO, uh, OT for OOI, please? Uh, sure. We, so we're in distributed program. It's made up of Oregon State University, Wisconsin Oceanographic, and uh, University of Washington. And those elements of all the implementing organizations, and they have their own infrastructure. They've got their own servers, their own networks um, that they are responsible for. And then we have the data center, which is another implementing organization since at OSU, and we have our own systems in place. Um, and there is some communication and been working with Trusted CI to think about broadening our cybersecurity program so that we're all uh, more or less in the same boat uh, with respect to uh, IT connections and these sorts of things. Specifically for the data center, what we've been thinking about over the last year as we've gone through this renewal process that was just uh, awarded by the National Science Foundation is our new data center and what uh, the security looks like around that data center, uh, around uh, disaster recovery, these sorts of things. And so we've been working hard to um, bring in uh, Palo Alto firewalls, uh, data domains to for data backups, building out secondary sites where we can copy our data to Bend. Uh, the state of Oregon is looking to the eastern part of the state for disaster recovery. Uh, and so other elements of OSU have data copied over there. So we've been working on uh, just on the physical infrastructure, trying to uh, better secure it and uh, safer disaster recovery uh, options available to us. Uh, also been working on the software side, I guess. So working with trusted CI folks, an important part of that coming out of that engagement was the CISO um, uh, need. And so we built that into our proposal and that was funded. And so we're now going through a process of trying to hire a CISO. And so that would be, you know, somebody will come in and uh, work on our policies Processes, procedures, that kind of thing, uh, in concert and with all the hardware that's going in now and improving our disaster recovery, so physical security of the data center. Um, but again, we'll be working with that CISO, with our partner organizations at UI and at the University of Washington to better secure all of this infrastructure. And that, that's fantastic that um, you were actually able to also build this into your budget and hey, it was funded and all of a sudden you can do security now. So um, that's fantastic. That's really great. We will certainly get more into to the weeds on this, I'm sure, as time goes on. Um, Tim, I'd love to turn to you. And um, I, I know we're, we're kind of far out for the ARV. Uh, last time I saw it was a 2030 target uh, um, uh, splash into the water. But um, can you talk a little bit about the cyber infrastructure that you're planning? I, I'm assuming that OT may be more apparent, but feel free to talk about kind of whatever IT or OT is, is on the horizon, and both the logistical and scientific missions that th those will support. So, so um, um, wow, echo. Uh, so, yeah, so OT, IT are like fundamental parts of the ship design. And so, you know, design, you know, building it in by design is actually, uh, I would say, a guiding principle for the ARV project. Um, what we're doing at now, we're actually, um, if you want to know more about the project, there's a draft RFP out there looking for the vessel integrator who's actually then going to take the design and actually start to, uh, build out the ship. But um, what we're doing is we're learning from our existing research vessels, the Nathaniel B. Palmer and the Lawrence M. Gould, as well as working uh, with uh, the UNOLS uh, community to figure out what's the best way to organize the IT on the ship and how does the OT fit into that. And OT in the vessel, you know, it includes things like the systems that are operating the ship itself that you normally want to keep isolated from others. But you need uh, readouts, for example, right? So as a, if I'm a scientist doing research in some part of the ocean, I really need to understand where the ship is, you know, coordinates and all that. So I have to get that from the shipboard system. So we, we're working through the networks and figuring out how do we share the information that the people on the ship doing the research are going to need at the same time that we're protecting the ship systems from, you know, the other threats and, and vulnerabilities. So it's an integrated part of it. Um, other examples, like, for example, um, how do we put um, networks out so that 
if I'm in my stateroom and I need to do uh, check my email, I can get that connectivity going. Um, you know, it, wherever I happen to be, wherever the vessel happens to be, based on what satellite connectivity I have and all that. So it's very much an integral part of the design. The vessel itself, it's um, it's an NSF owned vessel, so. Um, we're following the NSF Research Infrastructure Guide for the development of the vessel and cyber infrastructure, which includes cybersecurity, is a core part of the Research Infrastructure Guide. And I know um, Trusted CI has been part of uh, developing those sections. And um, if anybody, if you heard Michael Korn's uh, presentation on Tuesday, it looks like the rig will be getting an update soon, which I think is a, a good thing. So, um, so yeah, so it's it's the rig requires us to incorporate design. We're also um, Moving off from the vessel just a little bit, uh, we've got some initiatives underway for just general Antarctic infrastructure recapitalization that the science board has approved. And that also will look at, you know, we'll use the rig as its overarching guidance for how we implement um, cyber infrastructure within our uh, various projects. And those will include some OT projects at the stations that, you know, upgrade switch gear, those kind of things. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Tim. Uh, all, all of these things are leading me to sound like these are incredibly sophisticated, incredibly complicated uh, systems that you are, are putting together with really tremendous integration challenges. Uh, you're putting together a lot of things that may or may not be used to being on the same network with each other or being operated by the same sort of people. So um, my, my next question, and maybe I'll, I'll try and toss this one to Ezra if, if you're okay with this, is I'm curious about your experiences in the past with integration, um, maybe with sea trials to the degree that you've been involved with SIO's uh, previous uh, ship um, um, uh, acquisitions. Um, and, and related to this, any horror stories that you'd be willing to, to share, um, not necessarily cybersecurity, and feel free to, to, to anonymize anything that you want. Um, so I've only been dealing with ships for years, so I'm going to have to run that part of the question, John. Um, I do want to say, though, so for the audience here, if you haven't worked with ships, they're a boot. <laughs> we have been doing IT for 20 plus years, uh, but on the campus level. And it's been very interesting because essentially what I'm learning is the ships are moving from floating laboratories to like standalone. I mean, they'd be able to function without network connectivity in the middle of the ocean, without access to any kind of spare parts or anything. So they're fully standalone things that go out for weeks at a time, collect their data, and come back. And now, as John likes to say, they're becoming floating buildings mm. on the university campus, dependent on being able to use all kinds of connectivity, campus systems, software as a service, the cloud, things that didn't exist in the past. And that is tremendously cool because you can now do things you've learned and we've been doing on campuses for decades, the last five years, and you can start applying onto ships. You can integrate them that way into standard processes. And that's sort of where John and I have had a good relationship because I know about how we do it on the, the main campus where I can advocate on his behalf and how we change main campus procedures so they can all support the ships. But the funny thing is, sometimes these ships still lose their connectivity because they're sailing in the wrong direction or they're in a storm and the mast is in the way stuff you learn. But I mean, you can like adjust your course to like two degrees and <laughs> maintain a connection to the satellite. No, so they go offline for several hours and then they switch back from floating building to floating laboratory. And that has to be seamless because the science continues 24 7, 365, pretty much in a different time zone. That sort of creates integration questions as to like how do you handle that transfer between the two scenarios in a way that is not, um, uh, not problematic, disruptive for the scientists. So that's, I, I highly recommend it. If you have ships in your neighborhood, go visit them. <laughs> Very good. John, Very good. Yeah. In integration, possible horror stories, uh, uh, experiences. Uh, I guess I could talk about a gap I keep seeing as a trend that keeps coming up over again, um, which is sort of related to this. It's that we keep having this foundational need as these ships become more like floating buildings for subject matter experts of all disciplines to access equipment on board the ship or for the ship to communicate equipment off the ship um, but operationally one of the big concerns is for Lucy you know you can fix your 1983 car you can't fix your 23 car we need the factory to be able to phone into components that are on the ship and so it's it's not so much a, a horror story I could say is that when you don't fill that need 
people are going to do what they're going to do. And so uh, we have had uh, ships engineers out of desperation to get support from the vendors, string a network cable, cross patch things they shouldn't be, putting things online that they shouldn't be because they need to get support. And so uh, with CCRB and that converting our other vessels, we're working actively. Uh, our belief is we need to bridge OT and IT networks at the single point, control that tightly, but allow the access that needs to happen for off ship, you know, at, uh, support for multiple disciplines. And that you know, goes from a winch that operates uh, something on the ship to a specialized piece of science gear that is only on board for you know a few days. Uh, all of that needs that kind of support model as the ships evolve. And, and, and th this, this notion of bringing something onto the ship for a few days, that, that's sort of got to be horrifying to constantly introduce new things into this environment as well. Uh, well we're institutionalized, so we <laughs> accept that. Very um, good. Really, in, in terms of modern design, at least I'm guessing you guys do this too, we, uh, we just segment off to a network that we trust less. Right. It's okay. We'll see. Very good, Brian. Um, Chris, did, did, um, uh, do you have some experiences with integration, particularly in the maritime domain uh, at this point? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we are, in, we, we are upstream of our sea trials mm. or even our factory acceptance trials. And do you want to describe what that means actually a little bit and for folks? Yeah, that... it, I switched over from a research lab to this construction project about eight years ago and um, it's, my eyes just boom, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's complicated. Um, when you go through the construction project, uh, in that you're working with a vendor to build you this ship, and um, we built in seven stages of testing into the into the project. It starts with going to the factory. You know, so if, if um, I'm going to buy a, a suite of equipment from a manufacturer, uh, acoustic manufacturer, you know, I can when they build it and you go and you go to the factory, you make sure that, you know, baseline and all those things build up. And then you eventually get to the, this point where you're going out to sea and seeing how the, what can you, we call it sea trials and it is, they're going to have to pass a test, but it's all, you're also trying to figure out like, how do you actually use this equipment together? So there's a, a the integration is more than just how does it talk to each other and it, how's it behaving, but like, how do you actually, can you run things simultaneously? And also once you get, once you get through the, I think the, I expect that the acceptance testing of the ship will kind of tell you that, you know, independently the systems function and are safe. And then we go into a full year where uh, there's no funded science and we work on writing the manual, the procedures for how we're going to operate it and how, how we might host a, a, a team of researchers that are going to do geology. And it's going to spin up a whole bunch of equipment that isn't used on a different type of a trip. So, so the NSF has, you know, gifted us or, you know, reserved that amount of time to, to, to help us. And I think that's an outcome of a bunch of recent, you know, experiences. Uh -huh. so, so that's, that's something that we've adapted. Super. Thanks. Um, and, um, uh, uh, Craig, then maybe I'll toss that to you. I'm curious about your experiences with, with integration and the maritime space and all, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, a lot of integration that goes into the OI because we have all these different implementing organizations and they have their own equipment. So we have all this equipment that's deployed off Greenland or in the North Pacific or going to be off North Carolina. There's a cable array that goes out to an active volcano. And uh, you know, so all of this equipment is communicating back to its implementing organization and then back to ultimately the data center. Um, and there's different telemetry paths that we have to worry about. And some of these are more secure than others. Um, and so, we, I mean, a recent example of kind of integration and working with uh, trusted CI is around our autonomous underwater vehicles. We have these gliders. Um, and this also kind of gets to some of the vendor negotiations and, and relationships. Uh, and the telemetry from those gliders was not encrypted. Uh, and you know, we've talked with Trusted CI about this, and it's a known vulnerability, potentially, that somebody could get into those communications. Um, and we've now gone back to the vendor and talked to them about this. And luckily with Teledyne, they're big enough to be able to say, oh, yeah, well, you guys never asked to have that <laughs> encrypted, so yeah, I think we can do that. One of the <laughs> largest um, customers, the Navy, and clearly that's all encrypted. 
And so it's been really, really useful in terms of just pushing some of these conversations and being able to talk to vendors and have, uh, you know, in terms of the integration of things, um, those, uh, those uh, gliders in this case, better integrated into our system, more securely integrated into our system. So we'll be um, securing those uh, communications. I will say with some of the smaller vendors, and I'm guessing the ships deal with this too, the integration is harder because there are bespoke little vendors and trying to work with these vendors is really difficult when they have limited R&D budgets. And to go to them and say, well, we really want you to change how you're doing things. We want to better secure these set of communication paths. They're going to say, with what money? You know? <laughs> uh, and so there, there are different, you know, different conversations. It's easier with a big organization like Teledyne to have these conversations, but uh, we do need to have them sometimes with smaller vendors, and that, that is a challenge. Very good. Thank you, Craig. Yeah, maybe just a small part. Uh, I mean, it's not quite mom and pop necessarily, but if you take, you know, Montana, uh, one of our vendors is in Montana, and uh, they they build pH sensors, and they're a pretty small organization. And if we go to them and say, you need to swap out this board, you need to change this connection, that is not something that they can do easily. But then they just won't do it. Wow. You know, sometimes they really don't. They want this, so that's a challenge in terms of that integration. And upgrading, and we do have these conversations. We're a twenty-five to thirty-year program. We're going to have to swap out all of this technology, and, and going through the glider process now, where we're swapping from G two to G three, is a great opportunity in conjunction with conversations with trusted CI to really have these conversations and try to move us towards a more secure environment. Super, thanks, Craig. Uh, Tim, yeah, you, you've worked on you know ships to satellites to, to buildings um, uh, and and everything in between. Um, <laughs> Uh, your, your life must be about integration of, of strange components. <laughs> I've certainly had some opportunities um, that don't always cross people's paths, um, especially time in the Air Force, and that always provides opportunities, right? <clears throat> I think the, the challenge, and you know, as um, the gentleman pointed out about working with small businesses, they have zero um, funding to make changes to um, <clears throat> products that they've been selling in the commercial sector for forever, right? And I think that's kind of inherent in the nature of operational technologies is that, um, you know, we joke about the car in 83 versus the car in 2023, right? Well, um, from an operational technology perspective, that 1983 operational te technology is still alive and well and functioning and intended to do so. And why do you need to mess with it, right? Um, a war story from NOAA, we had Windows NT devices in our environment that we could not patch because that would void the warranty from the manufacturer, um, who was the only company in the world that made those particular devices that we needed to get the satellite signals down from the satellites and then turn them into usable data, right? So um, it's it's always one of those things. And I think um, this goes back to um, secure by design, build it in from the beginning, as we, we talked about, making sure that you line out your requirements and, and you kind of put in things like, hey, don't stick me with an operating system that can't be updated, right? If you're going to give me a capability, make sure that I can update the underlying operating system that's residing on. And that's where OT and IT really are starting to, to merge and blend, if you will. Um, my point I've made to people in the past is if it looks or smells like it has software in it, you need to treat it like it's IT, even though it's a firmware chip that you're sticking out in a sensor that's going to gather climate data, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, and I've got a thousand of them spread over the country. You still got to start to think of it as I got to deal with that somehow. And I think that's that's where the integration key piece is key. And part of that is in the requirements that you build out that you then design to. So treat, treat it like IT, but 30 year old unpatchable IT. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, <laughs> accept and move on. You accept that you're going to have it with you for a long time and then figure out how to how to make it work. So um, uh, I want to toss a question. Oh, it was there a uh, well, uh, You asked for a horror story? Yeah. <laughs> okay. It, 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 Tim reminded me. Uh, we built in an obsolescence clause in contracting. So uh, the vendor, the, the ship here, Thou shalt not deliver anything that's obsolete when we take delivery of the vessel. Well, when a pandemic happens and a hurricane hits your shipyard and your schedule changes by years, um, it's causing pain, you know, financial pain in a couple places. You know, we found 
parts. Some things are easy, right? You know, cameras, things like that. But when we're talking Windows 7, does then the vendor doesn't know, isn't ready for it. How does the integrator being the shipyard deal with that? And then you, you don't want them to fail or have that kind of thing. So you, it forces you into some creative places. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, please. Ezra. Yes. So there's another integration challenge that we're looking at right now. It hasn't hit us yet. Um, so we bring these scientists from different institutions on the ship. So they bring their own sea vans, containers, full of their instruments. Okay. So one that's happening now is people want to bring their own Starlink on the ship. <coughs> so you have ours. Thanks to John. Right? But some of this is entirely different network presence happening on the ship. And before you know it, they're dual home systems and there's a path into our ship network that we didn't plan for that we have no visibility of firewall so that's something i think we've had a first request for that a notification from one of our captains who noticed hey this is container with a starship twice happened twice already mm -hmm. and there's physical security with the strength of the radiation stuff we generally don't worry about on the it side of things but from a scientific perspective, how are we going to make this work? Security-wise, um, research-wise, to integrate that data? I, I don't think we've resolved it. Yeah. Well, no, we had discussions with our network admin. His reaction was, we need to migrate towards ETNA for the segment of networks we offer to the science party. If this is the kind of behavior we're going to see going forward. That's a good first step in my mind. So we're going to treat them as hostile? <laughs> Sure. <laughs> <laughs> While supporting it. <laughs> That's kind of what you do with the student section of networks, right? You just firewall them off from the rest of campus. Know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, another sort of integration challenge we're having is somewhat of a success story is building cultural bridges. So uh, working with folks who've been embedded in maritime for their career, they've got some learned habits that uh, are sometimes difficult to overcome. Um, but when we get to the point where we're talking about desire, shared, shared desire for same future state, uh, we can get somewhere. Uh, these examples, we've got a, our autopilot for some of the ships we operate right now runs on Windows XP. And so I asked the question, do we really have to have a computer that, um, on XP that's unpatchable as the main thing that steers our ship? Because now we're having to download digital charts. It's creating huge security risk that the crew are untrained on how to do it. And uh, our Marine superintendent went looking to do it. He's like, yeah, there's this thing over here that'll run on you know, Windows 10, Windows 11. And then we can buy this box. It'll download the charts and like safely proxy it in. And it's like, well, we're going to go buy it. Can we have IT review it for cybersecurity first? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, getting to that point where you could have that dialogue uh, took years. Um, I don't want to miss this point, actually. This is really important. I mean, nowhere have I seen is there a more distinctive culture of people that interface with operational technology than in maritime, where, where you have the marine technicians and, you know, essentially merchant marine kind of folks, uh, you have scientists, you have IT experts like yourself. W what does bridging that culture look like? What, what are these different communities and what are their backgrounds and how, how do you bring them together? Probably the most diverse, culturally, the most diverse community I can think of. Oh. You have nationwide researchers coming in uh, from anywhere. And oftentimes, they, they, all they have to do is be at a US-based university. Sometimes they have international partners. Um, you get uh, a very diverse array of life experience with our maritime staff. Really, I guess, me for me, the key to success is putting on your empathy receptors and trying to meet people where they're at. And you try one way, you try another, and you figure out how can we get to where we have shared goals? Um, that's it, yeah. Um, John, yeah. I know the key to failure. OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, I, I uh, come from the RBC Kuliak, which has a lot of similar problems, but did not think ahead like these folks were trying to. And so. All of the OT stuff is kind of completely separate from the IT side of the house on Sepuliac and a bunch of isolated networks. And it comes down to relationship building with people. But when you don't even have an IT position for the ship and you're trying to come in as an afterthought, retrofit and provide support and you're not there every day, 
even though I work on that, have worked on that ship every day for the past 10 years, I'm only ever there once a year or a few times a year to work with people. And if you're not on the ship, you're out of sight, out of mind. Right. And so I, it's very difficult to build the trust relationships necessary for people to work with to, to even get any traction on those systems. Right. And, it, and so as a note, I've been trying to get a list of Yogi systems on the ship for about the past three years. Last year, I got the list. There's 67 embedded OT networks on the ship. But I don't even know a single CIPR for any of So for the benefit of the people on the Zoom, 67 OT networks on uh, the RV Sekuliak ship uh, that uh, took years to, to get a hold of. Um, that's just to, just to get that relationship. And the only way I got that is because I did a favor for the captain. <laughs> I, did, I did my job for the captain, and the captain viewed it as a favor, and then asked me, was there anything I can do for you? You're all on the same team. Pardon? We are all on the same team, yes. And it took years. Yes. <clears throat> because, well, we can talk about why. Team perception or dynamic. That is a failure in my in my. I, you know, having an organization that has a ship's captain, I mean, this is just such a different dynamic. It's, it just makes it fascinating. Um, uh, I, will, I will say, for like with Sukuyak, it's the greatest ship to work on. Having been on that ship a bunch, it's it just is. like a fantastic, a fantastic well, team. Welcoming well organization, yeah. like they welcome it a while, and it's a great ship to work it's on. It's now on my list to visit. I'd love yeah, to go to that. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, bounce it to, I mean, so we've heard a little bit about network segmentation. It was brought up, separate ITOT networks. Uh, John's talked about this a little bit. Um, because of the potential ramifications within a ship, if there were compromised devices that could impact each other, um, you talked a little bit about zero trust, John, and, and heading to that direction as well. Um, that being said, we're all hoping that at some point we get devices that are less vulnerable um, uh, because right now, as we know it, OT devices have almost literally zero security um, control for access, security control for access, monitoring, authentication out of the box. Um, so I'm curious, what do vendors tell you, if anything, about the security properties of a device when you receive it? And maybe, actually, maybe I toss this to Tim first since I haven't reached out to him for a while. So that's going to go back to what did you ask them to tell you when you put it in your contract? And so, like, so I have a little bit of an advantage maybe over some of my university colleagues because I'm a Fed, so I got laws that tell me what I'm supposed to put in my contracts. And like our prime contractor, Lidos, who's managing the the Antarctic research vessel um, design and all that, our contract with Lido says, hey, you must do all these cybersecurity things and you must slow that down to your subsequent subcontracts and vendors. So in that way, I have a little bit, you know, built in, if you will, ways that I can come back and say, hey, tell me more about this device. It's not the same as saying you must give me a device that's secure. It's more along the tell me what your device can and can't do. And if it can be made secure, I need you to make it secure. But if it can't be for whatever, like I'm buying one of those 20-year-old devices that still work and it's the industry standard, then that's where, like in this case, Lidos is managing the vessel. But you know, in any of our relationships, we have to then look at and say, all right, where am I going to put this device that I can't protect inherently or within it so that I can build a, you know, a, some protections around it? And, and so that's kind of where we get into, again, you know, that comes into the design. So um, it really starts with your contract, your procurement activities. I, I think for companies that are doing business with the government, especially larger companies, it's easier for them, uh, especially if they're doing business with DOD, because DOD just says, you, if you want our money, you got to do it this way. And so we, as a small agency, try and leverage that where we can. Uh, the small companies, like the company in Montana, that's where I think we you know, need to make sure that we can work with them and work with their product. If their product is giving us the capability we need, then as whoever's, you know, as, when I say we, we meaning like the vessel integrator, the building integrator, whoever owns that final ship or that building or what have you, that's incumbent upon us to figure out how to make the, the small company products work to the best we can, instead of just dumping a whole bunch of compliance requirements on them that basically put them underwater and then we no longer have a good product that gives us our need and we no longer have a small business and we have people out of work and all sorts of other things, right? So it really starts with what are you putting in your procurement specs? What are you putting in the requirements that you're asking uh, people to respond to? 
Uh, that, that's really important. Thank you, thank you so much, Tim. Uh, and you've sort of uh, uh, teed up, I think, sort of some, some of the next question, which is, uh, uh, well, maybe I'll bounce this to, to Craig and actually ask you this first. Is how much, what, what kind of information do you get from your vendors, including your, your, your vendor in Montana and so on, about either what, as Tim just pointed out, what does the device do, um, if not its security properties? I mean, most of our requirements always you know, driven by requirements organization. And thinking back to when we went through the build phase, which was about 2000, late 2009, maybe 2010 through 2014, the requirements were primarily around how does this device operate? Uh, you know, how frequently can it sample? How accurate is it? How precise are these measurements? I do not recall any conversation around how secure is this device? What does the communication path look like? Uh, and I'm not part of the procurement, but we are moving one of the arrays and we've procured a couple more, five, four more pieces of equipment. I, I mean, I was part of some of those conversations. I don't think security was going to really focus at all. I mean, it's really on the science and uh, what can we do with this instrumentation in terms of how many pictures can we take, how fast can we sample. Um, the conversation that we're now having with Teledyne, to my knowledge, are the only ones that we're where we really started to focus on um, looking at the telemetry parts and trying to secure some of these communications that is between this OT technology that's roaming around the ocean and uh, our networks and infrastructure on shore. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there for, for these conversations. But again, I think it's going to be really challenging to go back to some of these vendors. Um, I mean, even when we refresh the super community, let's say 10 years, to I mean, I think some of them, like Teledyne, like Seabird, which is owned by Danahoe, you can have these conversations. But these smaller, you know, it's something that's spun out of Woods Hole and they build this one little profiling system thing, it's going to be a much harder conversation. I'm not sure how to support the, those industries. I think a lot of us are dealing with the spoke little shops. How do you support those industries to um, innovate and be able to better secure their, um, maybe we should be changing the questions we ask in and not only asking about how fast can this thing sample, but how, how secure is it? What sort of, sort of communications are we talking about? Telemetry between your device and us. De de definitely. Um, uh, that, that, that's, that, we, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, sounds, sounds like a, that, that's a good next step here. Um, what you're describing, though, sounds like you're often basically getting a black box um, uh, in terms of security properties, at least. Yeah, I mean, it's, they're, they're simple black boxes, so I think we understand them for the most part. You know, a lot of our stuff is RS-232. That's mm -hmm. how we communicate. Um, some of it's Ethernet. But a lot of it is still pretty old school and pretty simple. I think some of these instruments are becoming more and more sophisticated, and so these security conversations are going to become more and more relevant. Um, okay. But a lot of the stuff, if you buy a CTD that measures conductivity, temperature, and depth, it's a... TX RX ground connection that was pretty simple and we understand it, but we are getting more and more complicated instruments and we're plugging them into really, really complicated networks. Um, and so I think those those security conversations are going to just grow in terms of the community to have this as we're just plugging things in. Um, and the reusable cable array just got funded for a mid scale, it's going to plug into it. And I, I wonder, I'm not part of that at all, uh, what communication, uh, what Conversations are going on in that space that probably should be, you know, as they're thinking about their building. Um, yeah. Well, thanks, Craig. Uh, Chris, yeah, I was just going to jump to you on this. I was thinking um, what Craig is describing in the instrument space is dead on. Hmm. Um, we usually understand, you know, we're working with a researcher that's putting that thing together. <clears throat> uh, one, uh, when your team came to visit OSU, one of the things I did with them was I, I gave them a tour of. Um, we're, we're procuring like what you think of an OT and you know uh, an IT and we showed them all the network stack that I'm building and all this stuff and then we went to for a tour for the outfitting of the vessel right the sheets the linens all this stuff and it, there was the the stewards department there was a crate open and it was like a coffee pot or something and I think it may have even said like smart and they saw that immediately right and um, they asked me you know do you, have an, do you have an inventory of that? No. Mm. Uh, but luckily, um, we purchased everything. We don't need to put everything on the boat immediately. So we had this phase where we were going to repack and like, be smart about where we're going to send to Louisiana. And I asked the team that was re luckily before the first time they did it, when you're repacking, we added extra fields to their 
So I gave them just some one really easy thing to do. It's like, can you look at the box and tell me if there's, you know, what you see? Does, so it'll just a check sheet, so then I can then go dig, right? And I maybe it's not 100% coverage, but it's a lot better than we had. And so, yeah, the simple system, or the, the, the thing that you care most about, you know, the instrument and all that, or maybe the crane, you're really digging into, but you know, maybe we're looking at hard. <coughs> Like the network yeah, no, that, that, that again, that's so important. It's, it's, um, um, TVs, exercise bikes, right? Um, oh, yeah. It really is your home, you know, people bring, I mean, people bring, bring their music, bring their instrument. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, for the audience, I, I had uh, the, the privilege of visiting one of the Scripps ships, and there is, in fact, a gym in the, the ship's uh, the hold. What, I, I don't know what you call that room, sonar room or something. Yeah. Uh, it, it's technically where we keep all our scientific sensors, but <laughs> built on top of it as a gym. Yeah, um, so, uh, yeah no, it's, that's awesome. Um, uh, maybe to, um, to, to John and Ezra here, um, uh, you guys um, um, have... You know, in the process of working with CI, we've been talking about some security related questions that might be asked of vendors. Historically, you've all seen many things be procured by SIO. Um, the ride, I guess, at least during your time, John, um, maybe others as well. Um, what role have you or others like you had in this procurement process, if any, up until now? Um, so I can I can tell a horror story related to this and then answer the question. Great. <clears throat> um, so I went to procure something that was network related, and I got contacted by campus security saying, "Hey, we need to review what you're buying." I was like, "Okay, why haven't you reached out before?" I said, "Is this a new thing?" Said, no, we've been doing this for two years. Why is this the first time? And like, so I dug up POs, and uh, they're like, "Oh." Uh, all the equipment that was on here was listed, categorized as ship spares in transit, not, you know, didn't have any keywords that would have alerted us that, to care about this PO. Mm. So I had to go back and tell our organization, like, hey, we've been buying things wrong. And, uh, you know, a couple of years down the road, not that terrible, uh, but that was a, an ugly surprise. But that did help kick off some of the idea that, um, yeah, hey, it is, again, it was more culture bridging. In previous efforts, in previous years gone by, when we hadn't built some of those bridges, uh, you know, even this, uh, we want to get rid of our autopilot XP. Our Marine superintendent was sort of telling me as a courtesy, he was about to act without any review. And when I suggested to him that we should have the people that were going to be tasked with supporting it after the fact review it and agree to it before they he purchased it. His initial reaction was like, "You're going to slow me down." And you know, he's a reasonable guy, and so you know, I pointed out to him like, "Hey, I'm not going to slow you down for support way later when we know about it first. So, oh, oh yeah, okay, yeah, we can do that. So um, at least you know, you can liken this to the person who's installing the air conditioner." Uh, in a building, there's the people working in different disciplines don't necessarily widen the scope of what they're looking at and think about how is this going to fit the overall profile of the environment I'm putting things in. And so, if you're not asking questions to catch it, you know, you're you're not going to get the answers like Tim was pointing out. And so, uh, I think the effort we've been doing with Trusted CI has been actually very effective because it is helping. Uh, sort of ratchet up the importance of uh, we're, we're working on templatized questions we can ask the vendors. Like Craig was pointing out, we can accept we can accept the Montana sensor and figure out a way to secure that with something around it. Um, but if we ask a question like, "Hey, will we have an easier time for integration on something?" and get, "Oh yeah, get this," uh, that's easier. And so. Um, that's, the templates have been very effective to date so far. We're just sort of getting started. Um, and then, yeah, in the past, to answer the question about in the past, yeah, there was, we've gone from zero to some to now we're talking about integrating that into a contract for a shipyard. Uh, so then the whole kit and caboodle would be 
the principle secured by design. How successful is that going to be? We shall see. Mm -hmm. Shipyards are shipyards, and they're going to do what they do. But uh, we are. If I look at the evolution of what's happened from how RCRP got started, Sekuliak before that, uh, you know, we've looked at the ten-year history of the academic research fleet getting ships. We keep doing better. So, uh, positive trajectory. That's good. Super. Thanks, John. And, and just by the way, you, you mentioned air conditioning. It, well, correct me if I'm wrong. It was either Home Depot or Target that got hacked through HVAC. I don't remember which one was which, but Target. Oh, both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So secure your HVAC. Um, very good. Ezra, did you want to talk at all about this one point? Um, yes, I, I really like the questionnaire that we've been building with Trusted CI to mm -hmm. ask the vendors about the systems. Uh, but the question I wanted to have added is also in the report, just like the government is telling us. You need to let us know if the government in three days or one day if you've been hacked. Well, we need to know if our HVAC system, engine propulsion, control system, anything, right, if they've been hacked upstream from us, because if they can now push data down to their systems on the ship, which is something we want because it keeps them up to date. But suddenly our ship is dead in the water because we got ransomware through an engine control vendor. That's a bad thing. It's a, just like we have to learn report to the government and we have to essentially teach these vendors that they have to report to us as their customers so that we can protect ourselves against things that are happening upstream from us. Super, Thank, thanks Ezra. Um, Tim, I, I, you guys, you, you've mentioned your contractor before, Lidos, um, that uh, is involved with a lot of USAP operations. Um, this sounds like um, it must add a level of complexity to what you do because you've got this other organization that's now interfacing in different things. I'm curious, how does Lidos play into the discussion around procurement? Um, you've mentioned all of the, the Q&A that you do with vendors. How, how does, what, what, what changes when Lidos is, is involved? So um, let me go back and clarify. As our prime contractor, NSF, we have assigned Lidos the responsibility for procuring, I'll just say everything <laughs> that relates to the Antarctic program as part of their prime contract. And then they'll work out the, the details and the specifics with vendors and subcontractors and whatnot. They have a corporate program that they rely on to make sure they're, you know, so we haven't mentioned it yet, so I'll mention it. Supply chain risk management, right? Another a wonderful phrase that we all have to deal with. So we rely on Lidos's supply chain risk management program to make sure that First, they're buying stuff from reliable vendors, right? And that ties back to they're a large corporation. That's one of the reasons why we're partnered with them. Um, and we leverage that to our greatest ability. And then as they're looking at um, capabilities, you know, in our contract, we we have, in, you know, included all of the government, you know, security requirements, right? FISMA as the law, all the OMB direction, all of the, the NIST standards and all that. So, so they're always looking at how do those apply within whatever they're buying. And, um, and particularly with you know, OT procurements, particularly in the case of the Antarctic Research Vessel, they're very much uh, working through how do we make sure we're, we're delivering a capability that meets our mission need in a secure manner. So it, so it really starts there. Our contract with Lidos, Lidos procures all of that. The, in our contract, we actually have a clause that says, hey, Lidos, all of these security clauses we've imposed on you, all the clauses really in the contract we've imposed on you, you have to also flow down to your uh, subcontractors and vendors to make sure that they're delivering you a product or a service or a capability that is going to meet the government's needs. Super. Thanks, Tim. It sounds like you're actually in a pretty good position, frankly, with being able to do that. Um, th th is that has that generally been successful? Yeah, it's successful because it's the only way to to work, right? Yeah. Lidos, Lidos can't deploy a capability in the Antarctic program um, that hasn't, uh, you know, looked at what are the security aspects of, right? So if I'm I'm talking IT or OT, right? So so the idea is that if they roll out a capability and you know we're coming at it after the fact, well, like somebody pointed out, right? Either you pay me up front or you're going to pay me more later in one way or the other, right? It's in terms of the pain. Right? But if they're rolling out a capability and they haven't done the uh, appropriate security reviews, well, then, you know, there's a flag, there's a pause, there's a, hey, we need to fix this, right? And if we can fix it before you roll out the capability, even better. If, you know, if we have to fix it after you roll out the capability, well, that's not a good place to be. So let's make sure we don't get to those places. You know, Super. Thanks. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, uh, oh, yeah, please. The Lidos is doing its job. So because uh, Scripps, we, we run several machine shops, and I mean, we're a stuff for Lidos, and 
that we've had to commit to meeting all the requirements for this in 171 for our machine shops. So that took quite some retraining of those folks in an environment, mechanical environment, where they weren't used to it. So Lydus yeah. is doing what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. That's great confirmation. <laughs> Um, uh, I also just wanted to make, uh, mention, so the, the discussion of the procurement checklist has come up, which Trusted CI has been working with uh, uh, SIO and, and other, the other facilities really as, as well for the past few months. Um, some of you, particularly at universities, might be familiar with the HECVAT uh, for, for procurement decisions as well. One, there's a distinction, a couple of distinctions. One of them is the HECVAT doesn't address OT. Um, and uh, the other distinction with what we're doing is that we also talk about why you're asking a question, uh, because although thankfully, I and mean, it sounds like these folks are somewhat more being included in these processes, ultimately the procurement person is probably not technical, right? And so helping them understand why they're asking the vendor to do this and weighing the trade-offs seems like it can be, can be a useful thing as well. Uh, Craig, I don't, I don't think you've, have you been involved with the, the spreadsheet and, and, and looking at that at all yet? Uh, no. Okay. Okay. I'm curious, John, what, what are your conversations with your procurement person like? Uh, and does is is have sort of the why you're asking this question helped educate them to a certain extent? Yeah, so our uh, the person that's largely dealing with, we're sort of, for a CCRB at least, we're in the shopping around stage, not necessarily procurement. So it's mostly our former Marine superintendent who's heading up the design mm. for CCRB. Uh, but we've been, you know, at those meetings, essentially training him on the questions to ask. He's uh, getting to know some of the fundamentals about what to ask, but, um, you know, essentially the main thing that I see him caring about is knowing that, hey, when I reach this boundary condition, I need to reach out. Um, that does take, you know, a bit of retraining, sure. Um, at least for us, we're so tech technically dense, uh, this is an old problem for me. Mm. Um, if I pass something off to a fund manager or a financial analyst to help with the procurement, there's no way they're going to succeed unless I say these are the categories of the things we're buying. Um, you know, the quote that we get. So, uh, you know, in some sense, it's it's old news to provide what seems like extra information about the procurement. You can't just blindly say, I have this quote, go get it. Right, right, right. <clears throat> Which is what we do when we're buying a server or something, but not for these, uh, right. Yes, John, please. You must have a list of pre-approved devices on items and things. So you're gonna go buy a bunch of these things. They've already been vetted, right? Well, that's, it helps to have a pre-approved list for the remote That's, that's what happens when you go buy a server. It's yeah. already been bought so right. many times. Sure. You don't have to need a re-review. Right. Um, any questions from the audience? Yes, please. So, is there anything that you've learned working in a maritime environment that you said, you know what, this fit, solving this here is actually more than just maritime. We need to apply this everywhere. Inverse. Uh, what solutions that are best practices in the industry are practicable in a maritime environment? Ships have a unique word for everything. A stairway is a ladder for some reason. You know, a bunk instead of a bed, etc. So there's this, ships start with the mentality of I'm a ship, I'm special. And when you look at it from a cyber application standpoint, it's more, what can we do that's normal that could be applied in this environment? So every once in a while, yeah, sure, we might get a notion that that feeds into a, this might scale better somewhere else, but at least uh, my approach has generally been, what are broad best practices that, you know, are more one size fits all that are practicable in a maritime environment? I'll, I'll just give a, a few things maybe off the top of my head. I, I learned that one of the major uh, constraints about cybersecurity and maritime is bunk space. You have a scientist or a cybersecurity expert? It's going to be the scientist, right? So um, uh, that means you have to do security without the cybersecurity expert. So that way it means you need uh, expertise more broadly uh, or awareness more broadly uh, among others. Um, another one was or more more remote support or remote support absolutely um, which probably helps us all in sort of an era of remote working as well um, uh, another one that came up was physical security there are doors on ships you cannot lock because, for safety reasons right and fire so plan. fire evacuation 
Exactly. So learning how to do without physical security or modifying uh, your, your approach was, was another one. You can modify your fire plan in some cases, but you got to address that. And, and it's, sometimes that requires the ship drawings to get redrawn. That could be $30,000. <laughs> yeah. And you also have to plan for more uh, more rust because of all the salt air, right? And so I, I don't know how that helps everybody else. But Tim's oh, Tim, did you have a comment? Yeah. yeah, I think you know to answer the question, what transfers from the marine environment versus the other? Um, one thing to remember is that for you know the reason why ships people think that they're special is well because they are. Their ship is their lifeboat, if you will, and so everything's got to work in the right way, or they're dead. So I think you know to the point about figuring out how to cross the cultural divide. You know, I grew up in a Navy family, so I know what a bulkhead is, right? <laughs> um, so, but uh, the idea of just being able to have those co basic conversations, which is IT people and certainly as cybersecurity people, we're always challenged because we get so down in the weeds technically and we lose sight of how do we communicate with real people that just quite honestly don't give a crap about our details. They need their stuff to work and they need to make sure that we're protecting them. And so it kind of, I think, the idea of having the conversations about what does it mean to be on a ship and why does the ship, you know, personnel care so much about this and not care so much about something else that can help us. You know, the idea about if I got to choose between an IT person and a scientist, the scientist wins all the time because that's what our mission is. Right. So then how do we build out robust, cap robust capabilities or how do we let them bring their own Starlink? Right. Which is another issue. I think, you know, that's really what we have to do is take our ability to translate between cultures and strengthen that and then share out across cultures, you know, this is why it's important to a ship person. So then that's probably why it's important to a scientist who's, you know, doing research in a facility, whether it's on a campus or it's at McMurdo or, or what have you. So that would be my two cents on it. And then as far as physical security on a ship, you're right, you can't lock the doors or the, the compartments, the, you know, the hatches, if you will. But that doesn't mean that you can't put your IT server inside a locked cabinet inside an unlocked room. So sometimes it's rethinking the physical security controls to protect our environment within the context of the larger environment of the ship where safety is the number one concern. And, and so those are my two cents. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I want to conclude with uh, two things. Um, one of them is that um, Trusted CI is supporting NSF-funded uh, facilities with secure by design efforts. Um, you should come work with us. Um, we would like, we are here to help you, um, kind of no matter what the challenges are for you and your facility, where you are in the design construction process, whatever, there are ways that we would love to try and work with you and help your facility to build security in, uh, but by design, we're working with these four facilities now. Uh, we'll continue to be working with them next year and um, uh, going forward, and, and we hope to scale uh, it to even more organizations going forward uh, um, uh, if everything goes well. Uh, the last thing I would like to do is, is thank uh, the panelists so much um, uh, for the fun we've had with you for the past few months, uh, as well as for being here, including even uh, being waylaid uh, over in Berkeley on your way home from Honolulu. Uh, we really appreciate you coming here and talking to the room today. Thank you.